It is now time for question period. The member from Nepean Carlton. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Premier. Uh, the government is one that frequently suggests that it is open and transparent. In fact, recent initiatives, whether it's been the Open Government or Bill 8, were designed to leave the public with the impression that your government listens. Unfortunately, with the Algonquin land claim in much of eastern Ontario, that hasn't been the case. What's concerning here is while there has been an agreement in principle, many people in the public, particularly in Ottawa, feel left out of the process. So given an entire region of Ontario will be impacted by the land claim, could the Premier Premier, provide an update on the status of public consultation. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and I uh, appreciate the question from the uh, member opposite, and I know that the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will want to comment. But uh, let me just say that uh, my understanding of the process that has uh, been underway for many years, actually, I was just checking. Uh, 20 years, 20 years, Mr. Speaker, um, in order to get this modern-day land claim right has been very comprehensive. And I know when I was in the uh, Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs, Mr. Speaker, we were working with uh, working with First Nations, but working with community groups, Mr. Speaker, working with municipalities to make sure that we landed in a place that uh, would work for everyone. So I, uh, I, you know, again, I appreciate the question. From from the member opposite, but this Answer. has been a decades-long process, Mr. Speaker, and it is still underway. Supplementary. No one disputes that the land claim should be between the Algonquin peoples and, of course, the federal and provincial governments. I respect that, and I know all Ontarians respect that. However, no public consultation was held until after the fact and only to quote in-feel detail of what will be contained in a final settlement. I'm sure that the uh, Premier understands that a claim of this size, which impacts 117,000 acres, over 1 million people Order, please. and the City of Ottawa, including other residents, municipalities, across this province and anglers, hunters, cottagers and landowners, Mr. Bagg, all we're asking for order. is transparency in the process moving forward with the additional agreements that will be in place. Will the Premier review the government's plan for public consultation and provide Ontarians with the opportunity for further input into this process? Question. Thank you. Thank Premier. you very much. Thank you very much. And as I say, Mr. Speaker, the uh, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs in the final supplementary will uh, will give us exactly where we're at on this. but but. As I said, 20 years of negotiations, more than 20 years of negotiations, Mr. Speaker. Um, Canada, Ontario, and remember, this is this is the Canadian government, this is Ontario government, and this is the Algonquin of Ontario have consulted with stakeholders, with legal tenure holders, with adjacent landowners, with cottage associations, and members of the public. And my my understanding, Mr. Speaker, is also there has been a uh, an advisory group that has been part of this process, that has been a, a parallel part of this process. So it has been very thorough. Uh, I appreciate. I appreciate the concerns of the member opposite that everyone who needs to have input have that input, but I would just reassure the member opposite and, uh, quite frankly, the, uh, the people of Ontario that this process has been extremely thorough. It is ongoing and uh, yes, the, uh, the, process will, the process has not uh, com been completed at this point. Thank you. Final supplement. Thank you very much, Speaker. Again, no one disputes uh, the importance or length of this land claim. What is concerning, however, to people across the province, particularly those in eastern and northern Ontario, is uh, you're not allowing residents the opportunity to have input on harvesting, on land use, and on waterways. This government once committed to the public that it would be consultative on negotiations of this type. My question, Premier, is what has changed? Why won't the Premier update the public? We've given her two opportunities to do that today. And why is this government allowing, uh, refusing to allow public consultation on the Algonquin land claim, particularly in eastern Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Mr. Uh, thank you for the question. The fact of the matter is, is that this treaty negotiation has been going on for some 20 years. Wow. In the last two years, we've been approaching a dr draft agreement in principle. When that draft agreement in principle became available, we intensified the negotiations. There have been negotiations with municipalities. There have been negotiations with individual owners. There have been negotiations or consultations with cottage owners. Anybody in the Ottawa River watershed on the Ontario side of the Ottawa River has been given an opportunity to attend these consultations. I myself, as the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, have conducted three consultations here in the Legislature to which all members, Liberal, 
Tory and NDP have been invited, and uh, a number of you have attended or have sent staff. We have been uh, open and Answer. above board with these consultations. Mr. Crane, who is our principal negotiator, is continuing to have those negotiations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier moving from one set of secret and uh, private negotiations to another. The Green Energy Act has increased hydro rates, has been harmful to wildlife animals as well as to birds, and according to the Auditor General, has lost us jobs. For every one created, we have lost four. Many municipalities oppose wind turbine developments in their communities because the government has stripped them of their locally based decision making power. They are now forced to host these wind turbines despite the fact they don't want them. The Leader of the Official Opposition has reintroduced legislation in order to ensure locally-based decision-making is given back to municipalities across the province. The question remains, will the government support the Leader of the Official Opposition's motion and allow us to uh, give back locally-based decision-making to our communities? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, just before I answer the first part of the question, I understand that Norm Sterling, our former member, where is he? He's somewhere. Where is? Talk the question. Premier. Premier. I, uh, I, I'm not happy with that one. I, uh, I'll even tell the premier, don't step on my job. So I'm just going to do that. But <laughs> that's that's my fun opportunity, uh, and I do I do always want to introduce former members uh, to to give them the due respect. You've done that, but I want to make sure that people are aware of uh, a sterling example. Um, in, in the West Public Gallery uh, from Carleton, Grenville, 31st, 32nd, 33rd, Carleton in the 34th, 35th, 36th, wow. Lanark, Carleton, 37th, 38th, wow. <laughs> Carleton, Mississippi Mills in the 39th, Mr. Norm Sterling. She stepped on my job, but I apologize, Premier, you're Mr. Now, uh, in the middle of your answer. Yes, I apologize. And uh, Mr. Speaker, to the uh, to the member opposite, I think the member opposite knows full well that uh, when uh, when I took on this role as Premier uh, two, almost two years ago, Mr. Speaker, uh, I made member it clear that we were going to change the process. Order, That's exactly what has happened, Mr. Speaker. Uh, mayors spoke to us, communities spoke to us, and we have changed the process so that there is increased control over decisions making by uh, by those local communities mr. speaker that is built right into the process um, we are very proud mr. speaker of the clean renewable energy uh, sources in this province we're also proud of an industry that was jump-started yeah. because of our focus right, on clean right. renewable right. energy yep. but we knew yes, that there sir. were some changes that had to be made and we made those changes mr. Thank speaker. You, mr. Sterling here today, Speaker. He was the first to tell me I should run for the Ontario PC leadership, and I support his uh, his determination. I also supported Norm Sterling back in 2009 when we, on this side of the House, all unanimously opposed the Green Energy Act, which, by the way, overrides 21 different pieces of legislation, including the Heritage Act and the Planning Act, so wind turbine developers can build wind turbines in communities that don't want them without any pushback by local residents. Now, Despite what the government claims, their new procurement process promises more community input, but it hasn't really changed. Just ask the 72 unwilling host communities across this province. The only way to truly allow municipalities and their residents to have their say on wind turbine developments is to support the Leader of the Question. Official Opposition's Bill. So will the Premier listen to rural Ontario and restore locally-based decision-making once Thank and you. for all? So, Mr. Speaker, let, let, me just, let me just be clear what the uh, member opposite is suggesting. What she's yeah, suggesting yeah. is that we tear up contracts that are already in place, yeah. we enter processes that are already underway, Mr. Speaker, 
Clark. I do. The volume of the reaction is in direct proportion to the veracity of what I'm saying, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we came, I came into this office, Lanark, come to order. said we were going to change the process. We have changed the process. There is more local control, Mr. Speaker. We have built that right into the process so that communities can have that control that, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, I think is a good thing. I think it's a good thing for there to be that kind of local control. I also think it's a good thing that our clean energy Energy policies have created more than 42,000 jobs, yes, Mr. Speaker. That's a very important aspect of our economic recovery, and we will continue to work with communities and make sure those decisions are made locally. Final supplementary. With a response like that, there's no reason, of course, uh, Mr. Speaker, that to find a Liberal in rural Ontario is a rare sighting indeed. Right. One of the biggest challenges that this government has is credibility with rural and remote communities across all of Ontario. The rural-urban divide Order. is caused by disastrous policies like the Green Energy Act. If the Premier is serious about enfranchising rural Ontarians, she would support the Leader of the Official Opposition's bill. It is reasonable. It is never too late to admit you are wrong. Will the Premier reverse her decision to override 21 separate pieces of legislation and make wind turbine developers go through the same processes any other developer would have to go through in the province of Ontario? Yes or no? Mr. Speaker, because of the policies that we have put in place, the air is cleaner in Ontario. We have 2,700 clean tech firms that employ 65,000 people, Mr. Speaker, in the clean technology sector. Because of the policies that we have put in place and because of the industry that Remember we jump started, Mr. Bruce, Speaker, when I travel to China with the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment and the Minister of Inter International Remember Trade, from we Elvin were able to take to clean tech companies with us, Mr. Speaker, and talk to leaders in China who are desperately looking for solutions to the terrible pollution problems that they have in that country, Mr. Speaker. We live in the world. We do not live in isolation from the rest of the world. It is Answer. our responsibility to do everything we can to have a cleaner environment. That's the side that we're on, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. People who rely on social assistance count on every penny. But when a family sees a check for nearly $200 reduced to $1.70, or a family of five gets a support check for $5, that means they're stuck, Speaker. The Premier and her minister yesterday insisted that this was only an issue with overpayments and that people weren't hurt. Now we know that that's not true. Will the Premier correct her record? Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I actually said that there were. Uh, I, my understanding was that there was about one percent of the checks of the 500,000 checks that go out every month, Mr. Speaker, where there was a problem, and I didn't actually know in those uh, one percent of checks what the uh, what the issue was, whether it was underpayment or over overpayment. But what I asked first thing yesterday morning was that we check into that, that we make sure that people were getting money and that those situations were rectified, Mr. Speaker. I am, I am absolutely in agreement with the member opposite that people who are dependent on the social assistance system need our support and we need to make sure that they get the money that, that they rely on because it is imperative yes, that they have that every month. So the minister is working on that, Mr. Speaker, and uh, you know, I wish that this, I wish that this technological issue hadn't happened, but the system will be better for those clients in the long run, Mr. Yes. Speaker. Speaker, some of the most vulnerable Ontarians are being hurt by a computer problem that the government was warned about last February. The Premier was saying that problems with social assistance management system are just minor glitches, Speaker. But this is what people were facing. One parent was owed $170.35 for the transition child benefit, but instead she got $1.79. And a family with five children got an assistance check for $5, Speaker. That minor glitch might be the difference between making rent or not for that family, Speaker. Will the Premier do 
uh, make sure that she does everything she absolutely can to make sure that all of the issues that are outstanding are addressed immediately. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. I absolutely will do that. And the minister and I have spoken this morning, and she is in communication with the uh, with municipalities. She's going to be talking to some of the offices to get a handle on exactly what is happening at the local level. She has already spoken to uh, to uh, some of the municipalities' leadership, Mr. Speaker. And I am not minimizing in any way the impact on individual families. I understand that that is a very serious problem for an individual family. But, Mr. Speaker, we are introducing a new system that will help those individual families and all the families like them to get better service because caseworkers will be able to spend more time with them once this system is updated. It is not acceptable that uh, certain families would have had to undergo this problem, Mr. Speaker, and we are working as hard as we can yes, to sir. make sure that those situations are rectified. But I want the system to work better for them in the medium and long term, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, those very same problems that the Premier has insisted are just minor glitches have meant that people's support checks were going to their exes, to non-existent bank account, Speaker, to former trustees. Uh, for those people. The Premier was warned about these problems nearly a year ago, Speaker. Why did she ignore the concerns that were being raised and rush into a computer system that wasn't ready, causing havoc for hundreds and hundreds of Ontarians? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, there was no rushing into this process. It was no. a very well thought through process. And and it has not been perfect, Mr. Speaker. Every month, $570 million worth in checks is sent out in Ontario Works and, and ODSP payments, Mr. Speaker. 570 million checks. The outstanding pay overpayments, the issue that we're dealing with right now, is in the order of $123,000. So, Mr. Speaker, mostly the system worked, but there were some situations that I have already said are unacceptable, and for those families, for those families, that was not a minor glitch. For those families, it was a very serious thing, and we are working to rectify it, Mr. Speaker. And as I said, in the long term, in the medium term, the system will be better for all of those families because their workers will be able to spend more time with them, Mr. Speaker. This question is also for the Premier the Speaker. Party. The Premier and her minister have insisted that they acted as soon as they learned about problems with their new computer system. But the government got a letter from frontline workers back in February of 2014. That's nearly a year ago. In fact, I'll send it over to the Premier as a reminder. Will the Premier come clean and admit that she was warned nearly a year ago in that letter, Speaker, and that she did nothing until the whole issue blew up just a couple days ago? No, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that this implementation has been ongoing, and as there have been concerns, those concerns have been addressed. It, it, it did not mean that there was no problem with the implementation. We've already acknowledged that there were problems. But, Mr. Speaker, I have no way of knowing whether this letter sent from, uh, from OPSU was identifying issues that actually were addressed in the implementation. My suspicion is that they were. I certainly will double-check that with the minister. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that this is a system that needed to be updated. The new system will allow caseworkers to spend more time with their clients, and that is the objective. The objective is to have better time spent with the, uh, with the clients. I am absolutely clear, Mr. Speaker, that it's unacceptable that some families have had this issue with this implementation. We are working on making sure that it's corrected. Well, Speaker, it wasn't just Ontario's frontline workers who were warning the Liberals. They were consulting with Minnesota and Maryland, two states in the U.S. who use the same software speaker. Last December, the governor of Minnesota wrote to the makers of SAMS and said, quote, your product has made it impossible to provide Minnesotans with reasonable customer service. That sounds familiar, speaker. 
Why didn't the Premier listen when red flags were being raised by other jurisdictions using the same software that failed Ontarians just so recently? Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, let's just, you know, let's just look at this situation. So this, uh, this system is actually used. It's state-of-the-art software that's used by Australia, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Germany, ah. and New York City, Mr. Speaker. City. This system will deliver social assistance programs more efficiently, Mr. Speaker. Um, it will give it will give clients 24 7 access to uh, a portal that will allow them to get their case information, Mr. Speaker. I think that is a very good thing that people are able to get their case Absolutely. information. They can get it online at any time of day, Mr. Speaker. Kira Hynek, who's head of the Ontario Municipal Social Services Association, said this. She said it's going to be a better system than the one we had before. Mr. Speaker, it seems to me that that has to be the measure of the changes that government makes. Are the systems that we put in place better than what we had before. So. Are the implementations as smooth as they can be? Yes, Mr. Speaker. And do Thank we you. have to correct when there Remember are problems? From Lanark, Absolutely. Order, and time. that is what we're doing. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the fact is when the alarm was sounding about a computer problem that would mean major problems for the most vulnerable Ontarians, the Liberal government stuck its fingers in its ears. People on social assistance have a difficult time making ends meet already, Speaker, and with the holidays around the corner, it's even more difficult. The problem that was created by the Premier meant that some people got only 1 per cent of the money that they were counting on. The Premier is out of touch. This isn't a glitch, Speaker. It's, a, it's an issue that's affecting people's lives in a very, very serious way. Will the Premier immediately call her minister uh, into her office and haul her on the carpet about why this went so wrong? Premier. Fixing the black. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that may, be, that may be the way the leader of the third party deals with people, Mr. Speaker, but on this side of the House, we work together. We find solutions. We make sure that when there's a problem, we solve the problem. So, the minister and I have had a number of conversations. I know that she is working very hard to make sure that this situation gets addressed. And here's what I'm focused on today, Mr. Speaker. I'm focused on making sure that next month, this doesn't happen. That we make sure that whatever the issues were, that they don't happen next month, and we make sure that in this month, because I agree with the member opposite, this is a time when families are gathering and we want people to have, have their resources, that we make sure that people get what they are entitled to Thanks, in sir. this next round, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, a member from Bruce Gray, Town. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, in response to the scandal brewing with your billion dollar, quarter billion dollar social assistance management system, SAMS, or SCAMS, that resulted in 20 million in overpayments to 17,000 individuals last week, you stated yesterday it was nothing, a small glitch that you fixed in an effective way. The frontline staff disagree with you. They made over 6,000 calls to report problems with the new system. Again, it's your word against theirs. Clearly, they don't want you to sweep this under the rug. Minister, will you be transparent and accountable and recommit to restriking the Estimates Committee so we can get to the bottom of this and prevent any more nightmares for these people? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite uh, for this question. And I certainly want to thank our frontline workers and our municipal partners for their very hard work on this issue. I know that they're working overtime, and I want to acknowledge that adapting to the new system has been stressful, and we do thank them all for their patience. We will continue to support local offices as they get comfortable with the new system, and they have our support. We have sent out additional staff to local offices, and uh, as we've said so many times in this House, both yesterday and today, when an error was identified by those frontline workers, we immediately uh, took action to reverse the impact of, of that particular error, so that within 24 hours, approximately 99 per cent of payments were stopped or retracted Answer. immediately. Uh, we know that uh, checks went out yesterday. I would simply like to say, in terms of those vulnerable people, if Thank they you. notice an error, contact their caseworker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, my question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Your own confidential ministry documents show problems were identified last October, a year ago. You had to delay implementation in March and then again in, in July. 
You knew there were problems. It's obvious they weren't fixed, but you went ahead anyways. The frontline workers who knew about these problems should be able to, to uh, be in, in estimates and identify these and to testify. Minister, if you really want to thank the, thank the frontline staff and respect them, you'll commit to allowing them to restrike the estimates committee and allow them to testify. Minister, will you do the right thing? Will you restrike the committee and allow those frontline workers here, here. to come and tell the truth? Here, here. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And while we acknowledge that adapting to the new system can be stressful, we have been working with caseworkers and our service delivery partners to help them learn the new system and support them in this transition. When I received the letter from OPSU and from QP, I actually visited a couple of offices to see the training firsthand. I attended at the Hamilton office, the municipal office. I went out to the New Market office of ODSP, and I could see that there was a need for more training. And I immediately took action and instructed my official to ensure that everyone would feel comfortable when we went live in mid-November. So even before implementation, the ministry made significant investments in training to help frontline staff prepare for the transition. And over the past three years, we've been working with our service delivery partners, including frontline staff, on the Answer. requirements, design, and testing of the new system. We have trained some 11,000 users in approximately 257 offices, Thank and you. we know that at the end well, of the day, we will have a very good Thank you. New question. The member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Each month, uh, Speaker, 375,000 people turn to food banks in this province. That is a 20 per cent increase. 20 per cent since this government launched its poverty reduction strategy in 2008. When it comes to putting food on the table and a roof over the heads of every family in Ontario, the Liberals have failed to get the job done. The government's inaction has left hundreds of thousands of people in poverty. Will the minister admit this Liberal government has failed to address the desperate needs of Ontario families living in poverty and failed to reduce the use of food banks in our province? Thank you, Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Welland for the question. As I'm sure she's aware, we have restruck our poverty reduction uh, uh, strategy under the very capable leadership of uh, President of the Treasury Board uh, to address a number of issues as it relates to poverty. But in particular, uh, I think uh, the member should know that our government is committed to making long-term improvements to social assistance programs. It's in my mandate letter. I uh, will continue to work in this regard. So we have made it a priority to improve the social services system and help people in need participate fully in our communities and our economy. So building on the rate increase, uh, I believe you probably voted against it in the 2013 budget, our government will increase social assistance rates again in 2014, voted against Answer. twice by the a member of the third party. And so we are adding an additional 1% for adult Ontario Works recipients. And Thank you. With disabilities received. Supplementary. Well, the minister can make excuses, but the numbers speak for themselves. 130,000 children rely on food banks each and every month. That's a staggering number of kids going hungry in this province. 700,000 meals are served by our amazing food banks who do a lot of uh, fundraising each and every month. And the numbers of families turning to food banks for the first time increased by over 20 per cent this year. That's a reality of poverty in our communities. That's a reality of failed liberal policies and promises. Will the minister admit that with no target, no timeline, and no urgency to reduce poverty, this Liberal government still has no real plan to improve poverty for many Ontarians in this province. Thank you. Responsible for the poverty reduction strategy, Mr. Speaker. The President of the Treasury Board responsible for poverty reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And I completely reject the argument being made across the way that our poverty reduction strategy is not making a real difference in the lives of people. Let's take, for example, Speaker, a single mom with two kids working full-time at a minimum wage job. When we took office, her income would have been less than $20,000. It is now almost $35,000, Speaker. 
that family is doing far, far better now because of the changes we have made. But we are by no means finished, Speaker. We are just beginning our work on poverty reduction. In our first strategy, we identified eight indicators because poverty is also about breaking the cycle of poverty, improving outcomes for kids in schools. All of our eight indicators, Speaker, have demonstrated that we have made progress. Our new poverty reduction strategy is looking yes, very, very closely and strategically at the issue of homelessness. We can eliminate homelessness. We can eliminate chronic homelessness, and that is what we are going to do, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa, Orleans. Merci, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care and Wellness. Minister, the health, safety and satisfaction of our long-term care home residents is a high priority for this government. Indeed, the fact that you have been appointed to oversee our long-term care homes is evidence of that. We are, we are well aware that the government is obligated to ensure residents' rights, safety and quality of life for those in long-term care. Part of how we do that is through the inspection system for long-term care homes. Although I'm familiar with this process, the people of my riding of Ottawa, Arling, and Ontario may be interested in hearing about this government's inspection initiative. Mr. Speaker, could the Associate Minister provide us with some background on the essential purpose of long-term care home inspections? Question. Thank you. <laughs> Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, responsible for long-term care. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Ottawa Orleans for this very important question. Speaker, the member is quite right. The uh, Premier has indeed charged me with providing a laser-like focus on long-term care. And in particular, my number one priority is the safety of all 77,000 residents in Ontario's long-term care home. And it is in this context that we have committed to performing a comprehensive annual inspection of all of the 632 homes. The inspections, which are unannounced, ensure that long-term care homes in Ontario are indeed providing the highest levels of care. The inspections serve not only to find out if there are any weaknesses, but also to work with long-term care homes to improve our processes so that indeed uh, our residents continue to feel truly at home and Answer. safe in their homes. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, we'll be glad to know that the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care and Wellness is concerned with senior safety and is making long-term care homes inspections top of her priority. However, speaking as someone with a background in senior and long-term care, I'm apprehensive about the sheer number of inspections that have to occur in one year period. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the associate minister assure us that the ministry has properly trained staff to deal with the volume and enforce these inspections at 630 long-term care homes per year? Thank you, minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the member for this important question. And I want to reassure the member and the House that indeed we do have the capacity at the ministry to conduct all six, to conduct inspections at all 632 homes. And that is why we have hired and trained additional long-term care inspectors. In 2003, the ministry of the ministry only had 59 inspectors working. Today, we have 170. The supplementary inspectors hired will enable my ministry to ensure that every single long-term care home inspection is scheduled by the end of 2014. My ministry has taken concrete steps to ensure the accuracy and in-depth of new resident quality inspections. These inspections are resident-focused with an emphasis placed on quality of care and quality of life. All inspections Answer. place a high importance on interviewing the resident, family council and staff of the establishment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister, yesterday your government levied a new tax grab in the form of service fees to hunters and anglers of this province, an increase of 23 per cent in certain instances. Minister, this isn't a basic one fee for all services, but a fee for each and every service. It means $2 is added to each of a multitude of licenses a hunter and angler must purchase, such as an outdoors card, various fishing and game licenses, and tags for each for the harvest. This comes in addition to the yearly price increases to license. This isn't a simple $2 increase as you like to portray. 
Minister, you justify these new ba fees based on your claim the special purpose account is declining. However, nobody knows the details of the special purpose account because you're ignoring legislation and refusing to table the documents. Minister, Question. instead of in introducing new fees, why will you not release the details of the special purpose account to show hunters and anglers of how their money is being spent? Resources Thank the member for the question. Speaker, I would say that when the Conservatives brought in the special purpose account, oh, the intention of the account uh, was to be funded to the tune of about $100 million annually. About 66 percent or $66 million of that would come from the licenses and fees that were paid by hunters and anglers in the community across the province of Ontario. It's our intention to continue to try and meet that percentage base from the hunters and fishers from the fees that they pay. If we don't do that, the very programming that the account was intended to provide for can't be met. I know that the member opposite has a very keen interest in that. I know he's had briefings where he's asked about expenditures from this account within his own riding. And it's the uh, intent of this account to be able to continue to meet that mandate of providing hunting and fishing, good programming, fish and wildlife management in the province of Ontario. That's the intention, Speaker. Answer. And I would say as well, well, I'll, I'll provide the, the uh, further information on this in the supplement. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Minister, I've asked the questions. I just want an answer. Yeah. Here, here. Minister, here, here. Yep. if only the hunters and anglers knew how their money is being spent. I've recently just found out that over 14 percent or 9.9 .9 million of the special purpose account money that is to be used in the management of resources like deer and fish goes to administering the Burdison licensing system that your government has created. Over half of that money goes to the United States, none of which is invested in our economy or resource management. In fact, over the course of the contract that you signed, over $34.12 million of the special purpose account will go to the United States. Wow. Instead of finding efficiencies in the administration of the system, you create new fees. Minister, hunters and anglers like most Ontarians do not trust this government with their money. Minister, why will you not show some good faith, repeal the new fees, release the special purpose accounts documents, and bring the licensing system home to Canada where it belongs? Yeah. Speaker, before the, the fees that uh, the member refers to uh, came into effect on December 1st of this year, there was a significant period of consultation that was undertaken going back at least one to one and a half years ago. And the decision was made Member then that the fees would come into effect on December 1st. And it's not as if these fees just came forward and were forced down the throats of anybody, Speaker. There was significant consultation undertaken, and I know that the, a, uh, the OFAH uh, came forward with a view that rather than having a little bit every year, that perhaps this was the presentation or the approach that they would prefer on a go-forward basis. Speaker, the member raises a fair point. I said in a response to a question that he asked last week that those reports that he's been asking about will be brought forward in very short order. I can't speak to why they haven't been brought Answer. forward in the past over three years. It's our intention to have them tabled within the legislature in the very near future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Question the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. This past weekend, I met with people in my riding of Windsor West to hear stories about how the CCAC service cuts have impacted their lives. Member, oh, sorry, please. to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. Uh, the roundtable was hosted by our leader, Andrea Horvath, and I was accompanied by my colleagues from Essex and windsor Tecumseh. We heard from people like Sandra Havens and Sharon Mueller who had their home care services reduced or cut off completely. These are the same service cuts that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has been denying for weeks. Now that the Minister can no longer deny that these service cuts are affecting real people, will he finally commit to ceasing further reductions in CCA services and restore services to all those affected by the cuts? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm aware of the, uh, the leader of the third party uh, hosting this meeting and rally uh, this past weekend in Windsor and speaking to some of the individuals uh, uh, of concern. Uh, it's, um, it's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, that the, uh, for this meeting that the CCAC was not invited to attend oh. as well so that they could actually uh, hear some of these concerns from the public. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I know on November 10th, I know the member opposite and two of her colleagues uh, met with uh, the CEO of the local uh, Erie St. Clair CCAC uh, and talked about the uh, plans uh, going forward to address the deficit. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, it's important to understand the challenge that Erie St. Clair CCAC is facing. There was a re review done by the Lynn and by the CCAC uh, some time ago uh, 
growth, uh, leading to a projection of a deficit. And part of that, Mr. Speaker, was uh, evidence that showed that the level of nursing services provided by Erie St. Clair was actually 33 per cent Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the same day that the CCAC received an influx of funding, people in my riding continue to be told that their services were being reduced or cut off. Peggy Hoover was told that the CCAC would no longer be administering IV treatment to her diabetic husband and that this duty now fell to her. Sandra Havens, who suffers from MS, was told last month that her assistance from Community Care Access Centre was being completely cut off. While I'm relieved that the CCAC is less burdened by debt, the issue has always been more than spreadsheets. Will the minister apologize to my constituents and commit to providing them with adequate home care? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite knows that I'm working very closely with the Lynn as well as the CCAC. But I mentioned that Erie St. Clair, uh, when they did the analysis, they found that the level of nursing services was actually one third higher, despite similar demographics, one third higher than it is for the province. Wow. And in fact, the patients that are in the mild needs category is twice as high as what it is in the provincial wow. average. So the CCAC CEO, I think, responsibly undertook a review to see how they could bring that CCAC more in sync with the rest of the province in terms of what's being provided. And we did, in fact, it was on my instruction last week uh, that an additional $4.1 million was provided to the CCAC. That actual process was in process long before the member opposite raised her concerns here in the legislature. And we'll continue Answer. to work, make sure that they, they get back to balance, and it may take an additional year to do that. We're going to make sure that patient care Thank does you. not suffer, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. No question. The member from Brampton West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. Minister, Ontario is consistently ranked the number one province for immigrants to call home. Many of my constituents tell me that one of the biggest challenges facing new immigrants is the transition to a new workforce. For many high-skilled newcomers, the qualifications needed in their field differ from their home country. In order to start, in, in order to start providing for their families and, and integrating into their communities, these newcomers need assistance to find a job in their field. Minister. Could you, tell, could you tell the House what action Ontario is taking to help our immigrants transition? Thank you. Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the uh, Brampton from Brampton West for asking. As an immigrant myself, Speaker, I know how critical it is for Ontario to develop programs that will help the newcomers. Ontario recognizes that nearly three of every four working age immigrants arrive in Ontario have a post-secondary education. Wow. When we can effectively engage them in our workforce, everyone will benefit. This is why, Speaker, we have 92 active bridge training projects in place to help highly skilled newcomers assess licensure and employment in their field. Speaker, so far, our projects have assisted close to 50,000 newcomers wow. in over 100 professions continue their career in Ontario. And, sir, we are proud that Ontario Bridge Training Program is working. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for the answer. The minister, the minister is not the only immigrant here today. In fact, many members from all sides of the House came here from another country or are the children of Canadian immigrants. We should be able to agree that newcomers are a vital part of Ontario's ec economic and cultural fibre. They need and deserve our help to integrate and adapt, particularly in the workforce. But instead of, but instead of what should be a united front, we too, we too often see newcomers being treated as a second priority. Speaker, will the minister tell us what the government of Ontario is doing to ensure that the programs newcomers need are being protected? Good question. Minister. Thank you. Thank you again, the Speaker, for the question. Uh, our bridge training programs help highly skilled immigrants from a variety of fields, and we are committed to continuing these services. Speaker, we have budgeted to contribute over $63 million over three years, and in 2014 alone, we provided over $26 million to these programs. Without this funding, bridge training services would not be able to operate. We are making sure that highly skilled immigrants from around the world can obtain the fast-track training and customize the services needed to quickly and effectively transition into our workforce. 
Ontario, Canada is the land of hope and opportunities for newcomers. Our goal is to help them succeed. Sika, because we know Answer. that newcomers succeed, Ontario succeed. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. I thank the speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister, on the same day the Erie St. Clair Lynn gave millions in bailout dollars to one group, they told another group they need to prove their worth. Community Care Access Centre has managed to run a $5 million deficit only eight months into the, this current year. Well, they'll get a bonus. The CCAC's CEO has a salary has jumped 37% in the last oh, five years, and the number of employees making more than 100,000 has more than doubled to 21 from nine during that same time period. This agency was given a multi-billion dollar bailout. Now compare that with the Leamington District Memorial Hospital, one of the province's most efficient small hospitals whose obstetrics unit, you know, unit's future is unsecure. So my question, Minister, is this. Question. Why is the Leamington District Memorial Hospital left hanging while the CCAC is given bailout after bailout? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't know how the member opposite can say that the CEO's salary has increased that dramatically over five years since she only started at the CCAC in May of this year. Yeah. But, uh, Mr. <laughs> but, Mr. Speaker, I have to say that, you know, apart from the fact that Bill 8, which is making its way through the legislature, yeah. uh, addresses the specific issue, I think one part of the question that uh, the member opposite uh, asked, which is the issue of executive compensation, and I do want to say as well that the the the, um, the proportion of CCAC funding that goes to executive or management level compensation has actually decreased substantially uh, since 2007. The administrative costs that are attributed to our CCACs has also declined over a similar period. So we're taking those steps and putting in place, but importantly, Bill 8, I think, is going to give us additional tools so that we can address that issue of executive Answer. compensation. Thank you. Supplementary. Oh, yeah. Follow the money. Follow well, Minister, the money. Back in December of 2012, the Erie St. Clair Lynn was forced to postpone knee and hip replacement surgeries because it had used up its budget. The same scenario happened last year, and this year we're waiting with bated breath just to see what happens. In 2013, the CCAC had to ask for an additional $4.5 million in funding. And now the CCAC is forcing your hand, the ministry, forcing the Ministry of Health to actually give them a $4.1 million bailout. Yet, Leamington District Memorial Hospital remains with a $2 million shortfall, forcing obstetrics to close. Now, Minister, Leamington residents cannot understand why this government has millions to spare each time the Lynn or CCAC run out of money. Answer. can't spare uh, the needed question. funding for the highly efficient Leamington District Memorial Hospital Obstetric Clinic. So my question, Minister, is this. Why are your appointed health bureaucrats held to a different Thank standard you. of accountability than rural hospitals? Where is the? Thank you, Minister. Sure, and I, uh, I guess what I'm beginning to understand is that the the third party wants an increase to the budget to the CCAC, and the official opposition wants to see a decrease to the yeah, funding to the CCAC in Erie St. Clair. But with regards to Leamington Hospital specifically, and uh, I know that the uh, member opposite has been involved uh, and concerned about the impact uh, uh, on potential changes to the obstetrics uh, unit there in the hospital, he does know that uh, the, uh, the Leamington District Hospital is working closely with the regional Lynn, it's a Lynn, not the CCAC, to look at uh, various options. There was a meeting on November the 27th as well between uh, the hospital as well as the Lynn and community members uh, to enable all sides really to uh, speak to and address this important issue of obstetrical services. Uh, roughly half of the, uh, the, the uh, individuals, the residents in the Leamington area currently deliver, uh, choose to deliver in uh, Windsor at the regional hospital uh, already, uh, but I'm committed to making sure that we have an open and transparent process led by our Lynn, overseen yes, by the ministry, with community involvement and certainly with the hospital to determine what the best outcome should be. Thank you. To the President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, yesterday this government rammed through amendments to Bill 8. That's 11 pieces of distinct legislation, all in one Harper style omnibus bill. Liberal committee members voted against granting the children's advocate investigative powers over his entire mandate. They voted to open up questions over the ombudsman jurisdictions around court rulings. Shockingly, they voted against the patient ombudsman, a true 
an independent ombudsman making him a true and independent ombudsman. They won't be able to investigate inve uh, infectious diseases outbreaks that happens in private clinics. And we know Member that diseases Lord, happen in order, investigative please. Uh, in an investigative way. All of this happened in fewer than three hours. Mr. Speaker, how can this government say they're open and transparent and then that ram through legislation that is so deeply flawed? President well, Speaker, I am, I am delighted with, uh, with the progress of Bill 8. It says, you know, it's uh, I've been a long time coming. We've introduced this legislation uh, long before, um, before it came in this form, Speaker, and unfortunately was blocked uh, when the NDP forced an unnecessary election. So we're moving forward. And I'm also very pleased, and I want to thank the committee members for having done an excellent job. They actually accepted amendments from uh, opposition uh, parties, and I was very pleased to see that the bill actually was improved thanks to the work of the uh, of the members opposite. So uh, that's good news, Speaker. So what we're um, what we're doing is uh, moving forward with important accountability legislation. It has been uh, discussed for many, 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 many months because it has been before Answer. the House before. And, uh, Speaker, I'm pleased that this uh, bill has passed, uh, uh, has gone through committee, and will be back in the House very soon for third reading. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you. Again, to the Treasury Board President. I mean, you called the election, just for the record, oh! Mr. Speaker. This government, this government can say. Order. Start the clock. Order. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So this government can say what they want about Bill 8, but it won't change this fact. Yesterday, they voted to limit the powers of the child advocate. Yesterday, they limited powers and oversight over the patient ombudsman, a $52 billion Mr. Dollar Children, budget item. Come to order. And they've actually opened the door only for oversight by invitation only in the health care sector. Mr. Speaker, how can this government say they're open and transparent when Question. they created a patient ombuds ombudsman designed to fail? Thank you. Well, Speaker, I am I'm actually looking into uh, a nomination to the Stephen Leacock Award uh, uh, for a legislator for MPP, Speaker, because that might be the funniest line we've heard in this House in a long time, Speaker. So, um, you know, I'm very pleased, as I said, that Bill 8 is moving forward. And actually, I, I, I correct my record. The, the uh, legislation around orange oversight has been before the House for three years. We couldn't get it passed. So I'm delighted that this necessary, election, it is, it, this necessary legislation is being passed. So let's just remember, remind ourselves what we're getting in this le legislation. We're Member from Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Ombudsman to include municipalities, school boards, publicly funded universities. We're establishing a patient ombudsman. This is a fantastic Didn't step forward, exist. Speaker. Uh, we're giving the provincial advocate for children and youth new powers, new investigative yes, powers. That's very good. I know you're trying to justify why you won't support the bill, but I tell you, this is very, Thank very you. good and important legislation. New question. The member from the Public North. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, as you'll appreciate, Ontario has and continues to aspire to have some of the safest roads in North America. But even so, with the holiday season fast approaching, my constituents in Etobicoke North and Ontarians across the province are worried about the potential road safety related to impaired driving, caused by drugs or alcohol, or often a judicious combination of both. It's unfortunate to say this, Speaker, but during the past decade in Ontario, more than 2,000 lives have been lost and more than 50,000 people have been injured in collisions involving impaired driving. These numbers are intolerable, intolerable, and there's absolutely no room for impaired driving of any kind in this province. Recently, I attended a kickoff event for the 2014-15 holiday ride campaign to remind my Question. own constituents about the importance of this issue. Speaker, will the minister please explain to this House some of the details that we're taking to discourage the very serious problem of impaired Thank driving you. in Ontario? Good question. Community safety and personal services. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, I first want to thank the member from Etobicoke North for attending the uh, the kickoff event. 
uh, in his riding for the Holiday Ride Campaign. Speaker, the Ride Campaign is a year-round initiative that seeks to discourage impaired driving and catch drivers who drive while intoxicated. During the holiday season, Speaker, police in Ontario conduct more ride spot checks. Our government is committed to supporting this important initiative and to keeping Ontarians safe from impaired drivers. Since 2008 and 2009, Speaker, we have doubled the right grant program funding from $1.2 million to $2.4 million annually to support more spot check activities across the province. Speaker, during last year's campaign, 1,059 impaired drivers were taken off the road, making yes, our streets sir. that much safer. I look forward to providing more information on specific initiatives we take it in law, Speaker, to make our roads safer as well. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I believe all members of this chamber will be encouraged to hear about the success of last year's holiday ride program and about the number of impaired drivers taken off Ontario's roads. But I think it's clear and objective to note that our government's targeted funding of the ride program, thus increasing the number of spot checks, has saved lives. However, while they're very important in catching impaired drivers, ride checks speak are only one tool that police have to fight this problem. Unfortunately, the statistics continue to demonstrate that many people in Ontario find themselves or choose to find themselves driving while intoxicated. Minister, would you please share with us what else is our government doing to prevent people from drinking and driving these holidays. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I agree with the member 100% uh, that drive program is one way of, of making sure that people are not uh, driving while into intox intoxicated. But, Speaker, unfortunately, the reality is that people, uh, some people do still uh, drink and drive uh, during the holiday season, which is totally unacceptable. That is why, Speaker, we have some of the toughest measures in North America to further discourage impaired driving, including things like immediate 90-day driver license suspensions and ignition interlock devices. Um, our government speaker has also made penalties for uh, impaired driving even stiffer. As of December the 1st, 2010, individuals can have their vehicles impounded for seven days on the spot if their bl blood alcohol Answer. level is above the legal limit. So, Speaker, I ask all of our members through you uh, to keep a vigilant eye, to encourage friends and neighbours not to drink and drive, Thank and make you. sure we have a safe holiday season and Merry Christmas. New question. The member from Oxford. Much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister, winter has started. And areas from Buffalo to the East Coast have already been hit with massive storms. But here in Ontario, municipalities have not seen a single dollar of assistance uh, for the ice storm that hit them a year ago. It turns out the delay is that your ministry took nine months to produce an application, and it didn't give them training on the forms until 11 months after the storm. Minister, is this your idea of emergency assistance? <laughs> Well, um, Mr. Speaker, we don't, unfortunately, control the weather. Um, I, 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 I'm tempted to say that's a federal responsibility, but that would be rude, so I wouldn't say that. Uh, but I can say that when the, uh, when the ice storm hit, uh, we moved very, very quickly to meet with uh, a number of uh, municipalities to, to put in place an unprecedented allocation of $190 million Member for Prince Edward Hastings. Uh, in, uh, to help respond to that. Uh, we met with AMO and the big city mayors and others around uh, how we would determine the distribution of that. We got some good information, some good guidance sound. from that, and we used that information uh, to frame uh, the approach uh, around the, uh, the application for assistance. There were a number of municipalities conservation authorities that qualified. Uh, they are working at getting the information together, and as that information comes in, uh, we will respond as quickly as we can to get that money yes, to our beleaguered uh, municipalities and conservation authorities. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, according to your ministry, you've only received so far one completed application, and we're less than a month away from the deadline. Minister, that's not the only problem with this program. You hired an Alberta company to help with the accounting and the processing of 58 municipal claims and your claim to the federal government at a cost of $2.8 million. Whoa, whoa. So they are getting $46,000 per application to review um, in this process. Um, now, Minister, a year later, not a single dollar has gone to help municipalities. 
but nearly $3 million went to an Alberta company. Would you call that a great success of the disaster program? No. <laughs> I think, uh, I think the uh, disaster relief program is going to be a great success precisely because, precisely because we're insisting on accountability and making sure that uh, the party that on the, on the opposite side often calls for accountability and transparency, but when we, when we practice it, uh, largely in the response to the federal, federal regulations that the member from Oxford come to order third time and you ask the question. I have a lot of respect for the member, particularly when he lets me answer the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there, are, there are accountability mechanisms that are part of this coal program. Uh, every single dollar that's being paid to the accounting firm assisting uh, us in this uh, important task will be retrievable from the federal government. Yes, and the regulations and the accountability mechanisms in place are largely as a result of the, f of the federal requirements. Thank you. Your question, member from Tomiskamy Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. In just a few minutes at noon, uh, caregivers and hospital staff will rally in Tomiskamy Shores against uh, this government's cuts to our local hospital. It's been reported that the Tomiskamy Shores Hospital will have to cut 18,000 nursing hours, cut cleaning hours, cut their operating room hours by half, and close the cafeteria. It's hard to know what's going to be left. Why is this minister pushing ahead with cuts to our hospital and northern patients deserve more care, not less? Thank you, Minister. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we're not making cuts uh, to Tomiskaming Hospital, uh, but I do understand the concerns that are being raised uh, by the citizens of that area, and uh, they're concerns that I'm taking very seriously. In fact, uh, I've met with the Northeast Lynn myself. The deputy uh, of my ministry will be traveling as well to meet with uh, the Lynn leadership uh, in the Northeast Lynn uh, shortly to understand better the concerns uh, in the Tomiskaming area and the catchment of that important hospital. Uh, we uh, currently are funding uh, the hospital to the tune of $19 million uh, this year. Uh, and as uh, the member opposite knows, a, a new CEO was hired in February of this year. Uh, she's initiated a voluntary operational review to identify areas of improvement in the hospital. I think something we should all get behind and agree with. But my ministry and the Lynn will continue Answer. to work uh, closely with the Lynn to find a positive solution. Excellent. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. We know what the government's been doing to small and rural hospitals. Their budgets have been, cut, have been frozen for three years. So, but, but when you freeze a budget for three years, that is effectively a cut because nothing else has been frozen. Okay? There's no way that a government can ax nursing hours, cut operating time by half, and still expect the patients to be served, especially, and I'm glad the minister recognized Northern Terror, especially when the closest full-service hospital is two or three hours at least away. Once again, please, minister, do the right thing. Look at the effects on the hospital and Question. act, please. The Minister of Health and Welfare. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly what we're doing. And in fact, you know, the opposite is, apart from what the member opposite is alleging, we're actually investing more in our small and rural hospitals. We're not, we didn't, our, our small and rural hospitals, because of their unique characteristics, were exempt from the quality improvement transfer, yeah. the funding transformation that we've, not from the quality, but from the funding transformations that we've made for, uh, over the last few years. We've created a dedicated $20 million fund, which goes specifically to our small and rural hospitals as well. In we fact, we've since 2003 we've invested more than $115 million extra dollars. Deputy House Leader can move his chair, but he can't not hospitals. Hide. These are hospitals that we take very seriously. They provide an incredible, high-quality service to their communities. We're working closely Answer. with them. We know our Lins take this as seriously as I do and as my ministry do, does. We'll continue to work with Tim Thank you. Point of order from the member from Kitchener-Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to correct my record. I, and I, I mentioned in my first part of my question, infectious diseases happen in private clinics. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Bramley, Gore Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I invite all members of the House to join me in welcoming three special guests to the House. Majinda Palkor, who is the legal director 
the International Legal Director for United Six, Ranbir Singh, who is the Canadian Director for United Six, and Gurpreet Singh, who is a teacher and a reservist with the Canadian Forces. United Six is a United Nations recognized organization doing uh, humanitarian work around the world. Thank you very much. Welcome, our guest. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 10, an act to enact the Child Care and Early Years Act 2014 to repeal the Day Nurseries Act to amend the Early Childhood Educators Act 2007, the Education Act and the Ministry of Training, Colleges and Universities Act, and to make consequential uh, related amendments to other acts. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
For all members, please take their seats. All members, take their seats, please. On December 1st, Ms. Sandals moved third reading of Bill 10. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Sandals, Mr. Lassen, Mr. Napney, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, 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 Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Duguid, Mr. Duguid, Ms. McCharles, Ms. McCharles, Mr. Quinter, Mr. Quinter, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Berardnetti, Mr. Berardnetti, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Cardry, Mr. Cardry. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Mangat. Ms. Mangat. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Damerlo. Ms. Damerlo. Ms. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Nad. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Ms. Creek. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please run. Rise one at a time. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mrs. McLeod. Mrs. McLeod. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Mr. Clark. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Yer. Mr. Yer. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marto. Ms. Marto. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. The ayes are 70, the nays are 23. The ayes being 70 and the nays being 23, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture, projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion of the second reading of Bill 7, an act to enact the Burden Reduction Reporting Act 2014 and the Partnerships and Jobs and Growth Act 2014. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill. Same vote. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
On November the 18th, Mr. Dugan moved the second reading of Bill 7. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Wynne. Ms. Wynne. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hall. 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 M